and thank you everybody for coming. Um, it's a much bigger group than I expected. Okay, there's enormous interest in restorative justice domestically and internationally, and there's now huge literature dealing with it in the criminal justice system and also in civil society. For instance, many schools now have restorative justice programs. Developments in other areas such as indigenous justice and truth and reconciliation commissions or processes, for instance, in post-conflict settings, are sometimes incorporated under the heading of restorative justice, but I believe there are good reasons for distinguishing these. For instance, there is need for a much more careful consideration of whether the aspirations and rights of Indigenous persons are best met by restorative justice. In Australia, the programs that have been introduced uh, have been mainly in the juvenile justice domain. We now have those in all states and territories, although the models differ. And notwithstanding the substantial interest in restorative justice, especially over the past 10 years or so, the proportion of matters dealt with still remains relatively modest in those settings. For instance, in New South Wales in 2007 to 2008, about 3% of young people apprehended by police were referred to restorative justice. In the ACT, it was about 2%. Restorative justice encompasses programs and practices which in general terms focus on repairing the harms caused by crime. However, it's often been promoted by contrasting it with the failings of conventional criminal justice. Comparisons often draw on simple dichotomies. Restorative justice is benign, progressive, forward-looking, reparative, and communitarian, with criminal justice as backward-looking, retributive, privileging expert knowledge, and limiting the capacity for the parties and for the community to engage, etc. Now, these representations are based on false dichotomies and offer caricatures on both sides, which allow the much more complex realities of contemporary criminal justice and of the double-edged nature of the community and informalism. The volatile and contradictory developments in the criminal justice system have been described and analysed by many people, including Pat O'Malley, David Garland and others. But in contemporary criminal justice, we see expressive and harsh punishment coexisting with diversion, alternative sanctions, partnerships into agency agreements, specialised courts and victim charters, etc. Likewise, Abel and others long ago offer good reason to be sceptical of some of the claims to informal justice. While a more nuanced and sophisticated approach has begun to develop in the literature, in co contrast to what John Pratt described as the early evangelism of much of the restorative justice promotion, it remains the case that restorative justice is sometimes embraced uncritically as offering an answer, or even sometimes the answer, to the failings of conventional criminal justice. But while some proponents of RJ argue that it should constitute a full alternative to the criminal justice system, in most models, restorative justice functions as part of or as an adjunct to criminal justice. Within the domain of gendered violence, concerns that criminal justice reforms have failed to deliver more just outcomes for victims of domestic violence or sexual assault unsurprisingly have given rise to more calls for restorative justice to be offered as an alternative. However, debate continues as to the merits of restorative justice and when it might be appropriate. I, for one, remain concerned that we seem to have become bogged down in this debate since it seems to offer a limited vision of what future justice practices might look like, as if future developments must conform with either conventional justice or restorative justice. But one example of the, the spirited debate that's been carried on is a recent exchange in the British Journal of, Co of Criminology between my colleague, Associate Professor Annie Cousins of this faculty, and Professor Cathy Daly of Griffith University, debating the application of restorative justice to sexual assault matters. More recently, in our own UNSW <coughs> Law Review, our Law Journal, uh, Dr. Bronwyn Naylor from Monash University has promoted a way of dealing with sexual assault which draws together and blends aspects of restorative justice with specialised courts and therapeutic jurisprudence. Several recent law reform initiatives have considered the application of restorative justice to the domestic violence, family violence or sexual offences. For instance, the recent Australian Law Reform Commission and New South Wales Law Reform Commission joint report, Family Violence and National Legal Response, concurred with an earlier Victorian Law Reform Commission report, which determined that further research, trials and evaluations were necessary, that it is premature to make any recommendations in this area, 
and that the issue should be revisited at a later stage. But first, what do I mean by gendered violence? <coughs> I use this term to refer to forms of violence that arise from gendered social relations, for instance, domestic violence and sexual violence. This is a reminder, and then I quote Miller and Mullins, gender and gender relations order social life and social institutions in fundamental ways and that gender structures life opportunities and life chances and opportunities and generates and legitimates cultural norms of difference and inequality. And I think this brings to fore before some of the real challenges we would face in applying restorative justice in the domain of gendered violence. Let me just introduce, for those of you who aren't familiar, introduce restorative justice. There's no one approach, but commonly accepted definitions include these. First, from Marshall, a process whereby all parties with a stake in a particular offence come together to resolve collectively how to deal with the aftermath of the offence and its implications for the future. Or secondly, from Bazemore and Walgrave, every action, this is a very expansive definition, every action that is primarily oriented towards doing justice by repairing the harm caused by crime. Common elements of restorative justice include emphasis on the role of victims, the involvement of all of the relevant parties to discuss the offence and what should be done to repair the harm, and that decision making is carried out both by lay and legal actors, and some models privilege uh, lay actors in particular. The most common forms of restorative justice are victim offender mediation, although that's practiced uh, infrequently in Australia, but it's very common in Europe and the United States. Family group conferencing or other forms of youth conferencing, which is our dominant model. Circle sentencing, which has been introduced in Australia, borrowing from Canada. And we're beginning to see the development of adult conferencing models in New South Wales called forum sentencing. And as I've mentioned, there were some models in civil society. Offenders must accept responsibility for the harm caused, even if this does not constitute a formal guilty plea. And in most proposals and models, there are protections on whether any admissions made in restorative justice can be taken to constitute a formal guilty plea. Restorative justice can occur at any of the various stages of the criminal justice process, including diversion from court, and most juvenile justice schemes are diversionary, but many adult schemes are not. Post-conviction, it's often a sentencing uh, deliberation form. It can be pre-release for those who are currently in jail, and the United States it even operates on death row immediately prior often to the death sentence being carried out. Yes, I have trouble with that one too. Some of the critical issues that we might want to keep in mind when discussing restorative justice include these. As it's commonly practiced in criminal justice, it tends to be individualistic. So while the capacity exists for the offender and perhaps the victim to be considered with respect to their wider community and the context of the offending, like conventional justice, restorative justice offers little opportunity to deal with margin the marginality that often under underscores crime. And moreover, as Chris Kinnean notes, restorative justice is also quite consistent with the individualising and responsabilising of both victims and offenders that is consonant with neoliberal justice developments. It tends to be incident driven, not surprisingly given its location with respect to criminal justice. We focus on this specific incident. But in the context of domestic violence and other forms of interpersonal violence, this specific incident specific focus is not really an adequate approach. We need, of course, a much more um, nuanced understanding of, of the histories of relationships and, and all of the factors that might go, up, go towards making uh, up, making up um, what constitutes domestic violence and might lead to the unsafety of victims and associated parties. An incident-driven form of theorisation doesn't take us there. And I've discussed that in some of my writings in, in various publications. It tends to be process and not outcome focused. And uh, if we look at some of the literature, uh, there's not particular attention to outcome, as long as outcome is something that is reached through a restorative process and as long as it doesn't exceed some of the upper limits. But again, if we turn to the gendered violence domain, is this a sufficient uh, focus? Is this what victims of gendered violence want? Or are they also concerned in outcomes? And most particularly, the outcomes 
that the literature suggests are vindication and moreover, for, um, um, first and foremost, safety for themselves and their children. It lacks a theoretical basis for understanding victimisation, a point that we'll, I'll come back to. It's not a genuine alternative to criminal justice, but an adjunct to it, as I've said, which um, suggests that some of the strong claims made about restorative justice being a total replacement for criminal justice uh, are unwarranted. It's also not a fact-finding forum. This is really a, an important consideration which limits the scope of its application. It points to one of the key limits for those who want it to be a genuine alternative in domains, for instance, in response to sexual assault. So whatever the enthusiasm for restorative justice here, it offers a possible alternative only in those matters where offenders are already willing to, exceed, uh, to accept responsibility. Proponents of restorative justice differ in the emphasis they give to its values orientation, things like participation, respect, preference cons for consensual outcomes, agreement, flexibility, and community engagement. However, typically, uh, restorative justice um, outcomes, as I said, are those met by process and there's little other attention to outcomes. In New South Wales, as I've mentioned, we have restorative justice in our <coughs> young, young Offenders Act. It's legislated in the Young Offenders Act. More recently, it was introduced with respect to the adult system in the form of a pilot program called Forum Sentencing in nine local courts. Just prior to the election, the current Attorney General announced it was going to be rolled out to all local courts in New South Wales. So we're yet to see how that develops. And I'll also watch with interest whether some of the critical assessment um, that came about from an early evaluation of that pilot study are actually put to work in reshaping what forum sentencing might look like in its expansion. Like uh, circle sentencing used for the Indigenous communities, forum sentencing for adult offenders involves participation after a guilty plea or after a conviction. It is the magistrate who determines the sentence, but participants in the forum have, a, um, have input uh, in shaping that sentence. As I say, the ultimate decision stays with the judicial officer. That's unlike the juvenile justice domain, which is diversionary, in which there's no judicial officer present and in which the parties together come up with an agreement. Restorative justice is said to be victim focused. Among the claims made about it are that it offers significant benefits to victims of crime in redressing the failure of conventional criminal justice to attend to their needs and interests. <coughs> Models differ in the weight they give to victim interests, but um, it's often said that by putting harm at the centre of restorative deliberations, victims' interests will necessarily be served. The, claim, the benefits claimed for victims include numerous symbolic, material, therapeutic and even moral outcomes. The aspirations of restorative justice to promote victims' needs and interests are laudable, but as some proponents have, have come to recognise, these aspirations are difficult to meet in practice. Many of the claims made have not yet been tested empirically, but the available research demonstrates that victims and other participants do report high levels of satisfaction, although satisfaction has been conceptualised inconsistently and typically measured in the very short term. There is no agreed theoretical account as to how or why restorative justice should benefit victims, but many of the claims made focus on the communicative potential of restorative justice. Several commentators have noted limitations within restorative justice responses to victims that include a tendency to assume an idealised victim that may in fact tacitly endorse victim stereotypes, a highly undifferentiated view of the victim uh, which pays little regard to victim characteristics, or the assumption of a uniformity of characteristics among victim populations. Proponents typically fail to consider whether the specific justice needs of victims might vary in accordance to the different types of offence, characteristics of victims or offenders, and types of victim-offender relationship. Much restorative justice scholarship also suffers from an inadequate attention to the competing interests of the parties and from an as yet underdeveloped, underdeveloped uh, analysis of the communication processes which are assumed to apply within RJ. And that's one focus of my work and other feminist scholars has often been to challenge this undifferentiated focus 
and to begin to think about how the competing interests of victims, offenders, the community and others uh, might play out and how the meaning, different meanings are given to offences and their contexts. So if we look briefly at the community of potential of restorative justice, I've said that proponents give great weight to this, that communication between the victim and the offender is seen to be the primary process by which conflict resolution is reached. Proponents commonly emphasise that the discursive character of, of RJ offers victims the opportunity to tell their stories and participate in determining an agreement about how to address the harm. This is said to be empowering, therapeutic or cathartic for victims. Kay Primus, one of the leading proponents, says that personal narratives oops, skip time, personal narratives are the primary source of information and wisdom in restorative justice. But the critical element is to use them to understand the harms, the needs, the pains and the capacities of all participants so that an appropriate new story can be constructed. Scholars such as Barbara Hudson recognise that the discursiveness of restorative justice is not without problems, such as the risk of domination and the reproduction of power relations. And she emphasises the need for ongoing um, strong procedural safeguards. As Kim Lane Chappelle has said with respect to courts, those whose stories are believed have the power to create fact. That statement may be just as apposite with respect to restorative justice. While restorative justice is not a fact-finding forum, the capacity to give meaning to the facts presented and the new story that is constructed may be crucial to shaping safe and effective outcomes. In cases of gendered and, uh, violence and other contexts where there are significant power differentials, the power to shape fact may play out in undesirable ways. Yet few studies have paid attention to how meaning is constructed within restorative justice. There is reason for concern that in responding to offences like domestic violence or sexual assault, contests around the meaning of behaviour, its legitimacy and the harm caused may be particularly likely to occur since popular discourses continue to trivialise such offences, challenge the credibility of the victim and or construct women as complicit, for instance by reference to allegedly provocative behaviour. Most restorative justice programs require that the victim and so the offender admits their offence as a condition for, for participation. But that does not adequately meet these concerns. The meaning of an offence cannot be readily assumed from a bald statement of facts that make up that offence. Where the parties have shared an intimate relationship, the meaning of a given event is derived from the context and the history of that relationship. And while the offender may admit his conduct, those words or behaviours may be minimised, neutralised or the significance to others opaque. <coughs> there may be risks in communication of intimate relationships and between parties who shared intimacy. For instance, the risks of speaking frankly um, are great in the restorative justice context and as Krista Smith notes, an unwelcome story or a story wrongly told conveys the, uh, runs the risk of rejection, derision or reprimand. Yet restorative justice approaches have not accounted for one of the chief characteristics of most domestic violence cases, the, the existence of ongoing danger occasioned by the victim's resistance to the batterer's <coughs> authority and control. Heath and, and Jennings, communications uh, theorists, talk about also the way in which people negotiate their relationships and in doing so calculate the costs and rewards of compliance, conflict, disclosure and relational commitment. In asking people who have experienced domestic violence or sexual assault to participate in conferences or circles, we ask that they tell publicly something of their intimate lives. This is not the formal, formalised and uh, relatively legalistic account offered by their lawyer on their behalf in the courtroom under relatively clearly articulated rules, but rather their personal story told in an informal setting in the presence of the offender and others with whom the victim may have ongoing relationships. Those with the capacity to participate may find this empowering, but whose account will prevail in the scripting of the new story that is derived in the restorative justice process? And to be fair here, I should acknowledge that not all restorative justice processes 
require face-to-face -face involvement by victims and offenders. There have been some modifications where victims can uh, send statements or participate other than in person. So for victims whose story is unwelcome, some of, there are risks of, of retaliation perhaps or of un inauthentic and strategic apologies by offenders. I've analysed elsewhere the many reasons why apologies, which are commonly valued in restorative justice, may be particularly ill-advised in domestic violence contexts. Apology and forgiveness are themselves highly gendered with strong expectations on women to accept apologies. But domestic violence offenders are well practised at offering apologies as a means of buying favour, typically only to re-offend. As Declan Roach has reminded us, the informality of a restorative justice process can produce all sorts of outcomes, including tyranny. Without an explicit, sorry, without an explicit commitment to challenging women's subordination, older or limiting understandings of gendered violence may prevail. Questions remain about the extent to which the values or orientation of restorative justice is adequate, adequate to ensure that victims' interests are met in the absence of any explicit normative commitment to challenging subordination. Some might argue that this is met because victim participation in restorative justice is voluntary. I'm not persuaded. The agency that victims of domestic violence exercise is likely to be constrained and victims will vary in the resources that they bring to the encounter. But the choice to participate or not is not sufficient. The manner in which the process proceeds and the safety and effectiveness of outcomes are not met by consent. As Crawford notes, restorative justice asks participants to take on a much more active responsibility than in conventional criminal justice. And thus, justice should require that any outcomes are grounded in a dialogue that recognises and takes account of underlying inequities and injustices explicitly. Let's move now to some of the some empirical findings that I think have got implications for our consideration of the application of restorative justice to gendered violence. The, the findings have mostly been uh, positive, but they have mostly engaged with questions of process and not outcomes. Evidence is strongest for victim satisfaction and procedural fairness, although as I mentioned before, satisfaction is not consistently defined or conceptualised and most other claims haven't been tested empirically. Victim participation rates in the various restorative justice schemes vary enormously, from as little as 7% to as high as 85%. Some studies have found a gap between the aspirations to meet victim interests and victims' actual experiences. For instance, in Maxwell and, Morris, uh, um, Maxwell and Morris's 1993 New Zealand study, they found about a quarter of victims felt worse after attending a conference. Those that did were concerned that the apologies made by offenders were not genuine or that offenders were not able to provide the reparations that they expected. And these were attributed to implement implementation problems and poor practice. However, however, other research suggests that implementation failures might not be the full story. Consistent with other studies, Cathy Daly's work on the juvenile justice programs in South Australia found evidence of procedural fairness, but less evidence of restorativeness. For Daly, these findings said, sorry, for these findings suggest, I can't, the reason I'm doing this is my screen here is blank, so I have to look behind me to see which slide I'm up to, so apologies. For Daly, uh, these findings suggest that although it is possible to have a process perceived as fair, it can be harder for victims and offenders to resolve their conflict completely or to find common, common ground. Findings also call into question some of the claims made about the benefits for victims of crime. As James Dignan uh, summarises, the findings are more equivocal regarding the part played by conferencing as opposed to, say, victim resilience, support from family and friends, or simply passage of time in contributing to any recovery. Few studies have examined how gender and other social relations such as class, race and age are expressed in restorative justice practices. But one which did so was a study by Kimberly Cook, um, which I'll come back to in a moment. Daly has, uh, has also picked up on some of these issues in her ongoing uh, work with respect to the South Australian studies. Uh, 
Her findings found that victims and offenders' experiences were shaped by gendered contexts of offending and victimisation in the larger society. This was pertinent not just for women and girls experiencing male violence, but in other forms of crime. Her work demonstrated that, too, that restorative justice may li do little to assist victims who have been deeply affected by crime. And she noted the variable nature of restorative processes that could be contingent on the offence, the victim, and the subjective impact of victimisation. Cook's study in four Australian jurisdictions examined gender, race, and class. She found that notwithstanding aspirations towards empowerment of the parties, remorse and reintegration, and bridging gaps between the participants, in fact, restorative justice tended to reinforce social privilege and disadvantage. Mothers of offenders felt were judged or felt judged as failed parents responsible for their children's behaviour. Fathers were mostly absent, but where present, rarely spoke. Community representatives and facilitators were seen to encourage outcomes that reproduced existing hierarchies. For Cook, the invisible privileges around gender, race and class were reproduced, embraced and recommended as strategies for future goals of the participants. With these things in mind, I now want to turn to say something more specifically about the use of restorative justice for gendered violence. Offences of gendered violence have typically been excluded from contemporary restorative justice programs. But when we look historically, we find that broad models such as victim offender reconciliation and victim offender dialogue meetings, victim offender mediation, for instance, all of which pa have been practiced for long periods in the United, United States, commonly included sexual assault, domestic violence and similar matters. None of the evaluations I could find of these programs, however, looked at the specific effects for, for categories of gendered violence. Prison departments in several countries offer, offer RJ programs for post-release, post, uh, pre-release, sorry, post-conviction. These are typically not, li not limited by type of offence and in many cases do involve direct contact between victim and offenders where, where all parties consent. A few studies once again report their findings with respect to different categories of offence but one British Columbia study found some concerns with respect to adult survivors of child sexual assault who were troubled a little bit about offenders um, uh, who were judged to lack authenticity in their apologies and in the assurances that were given. I've reviewed elsewhere a small number of adult programs that deal specifically with domestic violence, sexual assault or other forms of gendered violence, but I'll just pick up on a couple here. Let me say at the moment, I, to be clear though, that our juvenile justice system in New South Wales and forum sentencing do not uh, permit offences of gendered violence, although the early work that's being done around circle sentencing suggests that some of the cases that get into circle sentencing do involve, for instance, domestic violence. The ACT in 2004 took a distinctive approach by legislating for restorative justice to be used for both young offenders and older adults across a wide range of offences. Domestic violence offences will be included together with some sexual offences in a future stage too which depends on a policy platform for managing those matters. Now, just this week, um, the ACT are, are working towards extending their current scheme to include 18 to 25 year olds in a new stage, but they're not yet ready uh, to take the extra step of considering that it be open to domestic violence. So it'll remain limited to a small, to um, a range of minor offences, excluding those. In South Australia, the juvenile justice program does include sexual offences, and there's also some Aboriginal adult conferencing models, which include which are not limited by type of offences. So there are some practices, some programs in South Australia, including uh, gendered violence. In New Zealand, there are various schemes. The government uh, pre-sentence court-referred schemes exclude domestic violence or family violence, but the government also funds a whole range of community-based schemes, which vary. Some are diversionary, some are post-conviction, some include domestic violence and sexual assault. There are also um, community schemes funded from other non-government sources. Little is known about their processes, safeguards or outcomes, and the few evaluations are based on very, very small numbers. In the United States, there is a diverse range of practices, and some of my um, 
uh, insights into this have been informed by visiting two particular programs in Arizona. One called was called Project Restore, which was for misdemeanor sex offenders and no longer operates. Another was call, is called Constructing Circles of Peace, which does continue to operate in Nogales on the cross-border region uh, of Arizona and Mexico for intimate partner violence. The work of Joan Pennell in Newfoundland and Labrador in Canada has been particularly influential. She had a model which worked in parallel to criminal justice. It was focused mostly on child welfare, but many of the families involved were also involved in forms of family violence, some of whom had matters before the criminal courts. It was seen as a very promising model because it was based on feminist praxis planned in conjunction with both government and non-government agencies, women's advocates, indigenous organisations. And really importantly to me, it had the capacity to generate resources to support the families in ensuring um, effective outcomes. For instance, one of the, in one of the uh, conferences, Community Welfare uh, funded a fridge for a family who weren't able to store food. The evaluations were positive, but the project was discontinued because the funding was time limited. This model has been really influential and picked up in child welfare and a lot of the developing child protection models using uh, um, restorative justice have uh, relied on Joan Pennell's work. In the South Australian scheme, as I said, uh, a range of offences are included and Cathy Daly and Heather Nankara have done some interesting work around family violence in the form of young offenders committing offences against their parents. They've done a careful, analysis, uh, sorry, a careful analysis of cases which demonstrate vividly, how, to quote them, how ongoing violence between intimates and family members differs from incident-based violence and why the standard conference model and indeed the standard court and police model are poorly equipped to res and resourced to address the violence. The model also was not equipped to provide resources or outcomes for the victim, since the legislation limits this to, the out to outcomes for the young person. The victim can receive apologies or whatever reparation is in the power of the young person, but nothing beyond that, which I think is an important thing to keep in mind given the claims that are made about restorative justice responding to victim needs and interests. Our young offenders model in New South Wales is the same. They found too that these conferences involving family violence required more time and work much more attention to safety issues, a much more sophisticated understanding of the dynamics of partner and family violence, more time and resources in monitoring outcomes and accountability, and that none of these resources were available, but neither were they available typically in a criminal justice system. They found that the cases show that informal processes can re-victimise uh, uh, when offenders or their supporters do not take responsibility for the violence when they minimise the harm, or cause distress to victims. And that the most a conference could achieve was to re-image appropriate relations of respect and non-violence and to check and challenge pro-violence and victim blaming behaviour. I think we're getting close to time, but I just want to pick a, a, another couple of points out with respect to some of those findings and move to the discussion and conclusion. Whilst victim offender mediation is not, com is not commonly practised in Australia, a study by Krista Pelican on the Austrian restorative justice victim offender mediation uh, is, is quite important because she looks specifically at domestic violence cases. And yes, this does differ from our approach, but she used, uh, I think, quite a, uh, uh, a well-founded methodology. Interestingly, one of her research objectives had been to prepare a topology of domestic violence cases that would guide the selection and placement of different categories of cases into different programs some into restorative justice and some into criminal justice. But she found that she was unable to meet this objective because there were no clearly discernible <coughs> criteria that would guide the a priori placement of cases. Moreover, she found that, uh, that uh, victim offender mediation can assist the parties can assist the parties by reinforcing processes of empowerment, of liberation even, that are already on the way. But victim offender medi mediation had at its limits was futile in cases where empowerment had not commenced outside the process and where the victim lacked resources, whether these be money, qualifications or independence. <coughs> she found too that not much was going on by way of healing. But victim offender mediation did support the affirmation of the norm of the legally supported claim of the victim. 
as did criminal justice procedures. Project Restore that I mentioned in Arizona based on sexual assault um, has ceased to operate after very low referrals and a lot of controversy around it. Not all survivor victims, as they're called in that program, wanted to participate personally in the conference and, some, and they uh, developed a mechanism of su victim surrogates attending on their behalf. There was conflict between the partner agencies. But I should say, when I interviewed all of the stakeholders, the stakeholders were all positive about wanting a process like this, but found that this one didn't necessarily meet their aspirations, although some were more positive than others. Referrals to the program were very low, and when I interviewed defence lawyers, in part this was because they knew that the repercussions for their clients of not going to restorative justice often meant the case was simply dropped. Attrition rates in low-level sexual assault offences are so high in Arizona that they could be really reasonably confident that there'd be no consequences for the offender who chose not to go. They also uh, were trying to build <coughs> incentives for offenders to go along to the conferences. So, for instance, in Arizona, if you went to a conference, you escaped lifetime sex offender registration, um, and you also um, had the benefit that the victim would have to waive as part of the process any rights that she might have to seek civil um, remedies or compensation. Uh, but even then, the uh, referral rates were tiny. They found it difficult to meet the needs of all of the parties. The program was not restorative justice simple as we might think about it here in our juvenile justice system. Offenders were required to enter a 12 month long treatment program and as a consequence the program spent a lot of its time and resources with offenders, quite deservedly so. And I interviewed some of the clinicians who work with those offenders and I met some of the offenders. But those who worked in other sectors felt troubled that that was too offender focused. That, all, that too many of the resources were going to offenders and that the victims weren't getting the same kind of long-term support. There are also really important political issues in Arizona. One of the people I, rec I uh, interviewed, of course, said that um, given the conservative nature of Arizona politics, it was hard to get a model up to offer, that was seen to offer sex offenders something less than harsh justice. She in fact said to me, we do justice really well in Arizona. The trouble is it's, it's Old Testament justice. So the context was a really important one, which led to the, the, the program failing for all sorts of reasons, conflict between parties, the politics, uh, issues around trying to find effective incentives for offenders to want to go to the program. There were simply not enough cases. For me, these findings remind us of the limits of restorative justice and the difficulties of working with gendered violence, perhaps especially where the violence is ongoing. It cha they challenge the idea that we can easily select cases that might be safe and appropriate for restorative justice. And if restorative justice is to be used, they point to the need for a much more sophisticated approach un and understanding with many more resources. Recognising that victims, offenders and others have competing interests and are differently positioned also offers insights and challenges to restorative <coughs> justice theory and practice and aids in consideration of assumptions that underpin ideas about the communication exchanges between parties that are so central to restorative justice. The findings should also temper some of the strong claims made about the therapeutic benefits of restorative justice for victims, and also remind us that informal processes can re-victimise. They also highlight the need to attend to the preconditions that might be, need to be met in order for restorative justice to be politically achievable and to be supported by the community that it is seeking to engage. For me, they highlight the limitations of generic models of restorative justice for use with gendered violence. Some influential scholars like James Dignam is, are satisfied that all victims can be treated with equal concern and respect and should be entitled to receive reparation within processes like restorative justice. For Dignam, there's no reason in principle why any offence, including domestic violence, should be excluded from eligibility provided that the victims feel, victim feels that they would benefit. This approach seems to suggest that the key question is one of exclusion or exclusion from generic restorative justice models. I would argue that in working towards a safe and more effective form of justice for victims of domestic violence or other forms of gendered harm, this isn't sufficient. Generic models will not do. They fail to attend sufficiently to the specific character of the violence. It has a, they have a limited vision of victim needs. 
if restorative justice is to be true to the promises it makes to victims, it may need to adopt models that have the potential to connect them with services, supports and outcomes beyond the apology and reparation that may be in the capacity of the offender to provide uh, if they wish to or if they're able to offer it. I actually uh, recommend that we look beyond the dichotomous construction that the only options are restorative justice or conventional justice and think more creatively about hybrid models uh, that might better meet justice needs. And I think I'll leave it at that point. Thank you.